Jeffrey Can, and you're listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled, Will a Venezuelan oil-backed cryptocurrency actually work? The Venezuelan government has announced their intent to launch a cryptocurrency called Petro, backed by their oil reserves. How might this play out? And why Venezuela, and why now? First, a bit of context for those of you not that well-versed in oil markets. Venezuela has historically been a serious oil player. They're a founding member of OPEC, and the country is blessed with huge reserves of the stuff. Venezuela has some 300 billion barrels of oil it could produce, estimated to be the largest reserves in the world. The Orinoco Belt has additional reserves of very heavy oil, amounting to 1.5 trillion barrels. 95% of their export earnings come from the sale of oil and gas, and the sector is a full 25% of their GDP. Today, the oil sector, and indeed the whole economy, is utterly dominated by the national petroleum com- uh, company, PDVSA, which was set up when the government nationalized the industry in 1976. Venezuela's oil is technically demanding and costly to produce because it's heavy, like Canada's oil sands. The country initially welcomed a number of international oil companies, including Total, Chevron, Statoil, BP, and Exxon, to help work the resource. But in 2007, just as oil prices were at their peak, the government demanded control of these companies' businesses in Venezuela, and they agreed to sell themselves to PDVSA. Only Exxon objected, so the government simply expropriated Exxon's assets. Sadly for its people, the country overall is not in a good place. Thanks to almost 20 years of economic mismanagement by successive governments, first Hugo Chavez and now Nicolas Maduro, and the fall in oil prices starting in 2014, the country is struggling to make payments on its debt, and the Treasury is alarmingly close to default on its obligations. Inflation is out of control, and there are reports that its people are starving. Any available cash from the oil industry has been directed to meet financial obligations and to satisfy social programming. However, the heavy oil industry needs steady and substantial capital expenditures to keep up production, and a decade of capital deprivation has come home to roost. At its peak, the country produced 3.5 million barrels of oil daily, but today it's fallen below 2 million, the lowest level in 20 years. In 2003, Chavez fired 19,000 of PDVSA's elite employees and replaced them with party loyalists, leaving the company with a significant talent shortfall. Just in the past year alone, Maduro has continued the route, firing many more top executives and commencing prosecution of others on corruption charges. Meanwhile, the U.S. government has imposed sanctions on Venezuela because of election fraud and human rights violations, which makes it difficult for international companies to do business there. This is particularly challenging for the oil industry since the product, crude oil, is transacted with U.S. dollars and the technology Venezuela needs is largely American. You can see the difficulty. A need for U.S. dollars to pay down national debt borrowed on U.S. capital markets, a need for U.S. dollars to finance the oil sector, a wildly depreciating national currency, a 50% fall in the price of the product, an almost 50% reduction in oil production volumes, and real limitations on doing business because of sanctions. In a word, crisis. Venezuela's problem is that its economy is so tightly interwoven with the U.S. dollar. It borrows in USD, and its principal and only export is priced in USD, and it depends on international expertise and equipment valued in USD. Cryptocurrencies look like they might be a solution to this U.S. dollar dependency, and hence the interest in setting up such a vehicle. Among the many benefits are the following. First would be sovereign independence. A cryptocurrency, like Bitcoin, could be set up independently of existing national governments and currency-issuing authorities, including the U.S. and the Venezuelan governments. This frees the currency from government actions, like adding to money supply through quantitative easing that causes devaluation, imposing exchange limitations, and mandating specific exchange rate values. Number two would be limited regulation. Cryptocurrencies operate outside of the banking system, which reduces the traceability of transactions. Banks need to report large dollar transactions as part of a global scheme to reduce money laundering, but crypto transactions are not always similarly reported. Know your customer rules are not required. Additionally, buying and selling oil using a cryptocurrency could allow those countries under U.S. sanction to sell their oil at closer to full value. Number three is the ready market. I suspect that there are a number of countries only too keen to figure out how they could sidestep the U.S. dollar issue. 
Many similar countries have economies that are dominated by the production of oil and its U.S. dollar linkage. I'm thinking here of Bahrain, Oman, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Russia, Libya, Iraq, Angola, and Nigeria. Aside from Russia, these are all members of OPEC and have the mechanisms in place to meet regularly to work on important mutual issues like Bitcoin. Number four is the physical backing. In the case of Venezuela, Maduro has offered to back Petro, the, the uh, cryptocurrency, with the country's immense oil reserves. This helps reduce currency default risk, although Maduro, Maduro still has to answer to the fact that his government has shown remarkable enthusiasm to arbitrary seizure of assets when it suits him. Venezuela's move raises a lot of questions about how petrol will work in practical terms and how quickly it could be adopted. First, how about backstopping petrol? Traders in an oil-backed cryptocurrency may wish to have the confidence that they can convert their crypto holdings into a real asset, such as crude oil. There are ample oil storage assets that could be pressed into service as a mechanism to backstop the currency in much the same way that some governments hold physical gold to partially backstop national currencies. But how will Petro translate into a physical barrel? Will it be one Petro per barrel? Will Petro be limited to precisely the number of barrels in storage? And where would there be a multiplier? And who would supervise this structurally? Who will own the barrels in storage? Where will the barrels be physically stored? And in which court system is that ownership enforced? Why should the physical asset even be in Venezuela? Number two is conversion. At some point, a holder of Petro, say Petavesa, will want to convert that currency to some other national currency, say U.S. dollars, so that it can purchase some U.S. dollar denominated equipment. At this point, more traditional players who handle currencies, that is banks, could get involved, but these are the same players that the cryptocurrencies are trying to displace. A separate conversion service could emerge, but China recently shut down Bitcoin conversion outlets in its own domestic market. So, could governments impose, re impose regulations that restrict trading in Petro among the more traditional market participants? Could the U.S. government mandate that participants in its banking sector, et sector report their activities in the Petro cryptocurrency? Number three is valuation. The initial design idea for Petro was that it would be pegged to the value of oil, which is in U.S. dollars. But not all, oil, not all oil is equal in value. Light sweet oil comprise the benchmark oil indices that we all know and quote like we know what we're talking about. That is Brent and WTI. But most other oils trade with reference to the benchmark and are discounted depending on how much they cost to process than the benchmark. Will Petro reflect that same discount structure? Next is the futures market. One of the special features of the oil industry is its active and liquid futures market. It is here that most buying and selling of oil actually happens, where traders structure deals to maximize profits and minimize losses by selling oil forward. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange recognizes the potential of futures in secondary markets for Bitcoin and has announced the launch of Bitcoin futures instruments. For Petro to really take off, it would need a futures market denominated in Petro almost immediately, which is a much bigger undertaking than just launching Petro. Many oil trades are also completed with borrowed money, so lending facilities will need to be set up. But by who? Banks don't like crypto. Are the leading commodities exchanges and future markets even prepared to begin trading in this new cryptocurrency? Next is institutional resistance. Industry normally adopts change when an innovation offers materially greater benefits than the status quo. It's easy to see why Venezuela and other petro states would want to create a cryptocurrency. They could potentially manipulate it to their advantage. They could possibly sidestep U.S. sanctions, and they may get better pricing for their oil. Just the fact that Venezuela is promoting a cryptocurrency in light of its troubles casts the entire crypto sector in a negative light. And it's hard to see how other market participants would derive some benefit. Indeed, there are some, like U.S. debt holders, with significant stakes at risk. Those same debt holders to Venezuela also lend money to the oil industry, and they're not about to put that at risk. With so many of the players in the oil industry pretty deeply invested in the status quo, what features of Petro would be sufficiently attractive to them to want to move off the U.S. dollar basis? Well, I'm a big believer in how digital technologies can disrupt industries. The incredible success of Bitcoin, Ether, and other cryptocurrencies illustrates how fortunes can be made by overturning the status quo. Petro, however, is going up against the largest commodity market in the world and the most valuable traded commodity in the world, with all the institutional forces and structures wrapped around it. 
Adoption will neither be swift nor easy. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.